How do insects deal with all these nasty chemicals and defenses that plants throw at them? Just like plants, which are subjected to the negative effects of insects feeding on them, and therefore have a lot of selective pressure that uh, could benefit the evolution of traits that allow them to resist uh, and uh, deal with the herbivores, insects face the same challenge. What are they gonna do when they encounter a host plant that has all these nasty things in them? What's the opposite of plant defense? Well, it's herbivore offense. This very nice paper here by uh, Rick Carbon and Anurag Agrawal really outline the essence of these interactions between plants and herbivores. It's not just plants defending themselves against herbivory, but it's also herbivores having to overcome that, uh, th those um, defensive um, traits. So that's what we're gonna talk about uh, in this particular uh, lecture. How do insects actually deal with this? Well, it's easy to just categorize these into three different uh, um, modes. One is pre-ingestive mechanisms. That is, what can insects do before those uh, chemicals even get into their bodies? The second is ingestive mechanisms. Once the uh, plant material has been uh, taken in, what are the biochemical and physiological mechanisms that insects have to actually prevent them from actually doing uh, getting into the body. And the final is, the, the last one is uh, post-ingestive uh, mechanisms. It's gotten in, it's gotten into the, uh, into the body of the insect. What are the behavior, oh, I'm sorry, what are the biochemical and physiological ways in which insects can prevent damage from actually happening? So let's start with the first one uh, there. Pre-ingestive mechanisms. Basically, this has to do with uh, ways in which insects can deal with uh, the structure of plants uh, uh, and access that plant material or uh, prevent uh, chemicals uh, from getting into the body. So here's an example of a plant defense, uh, the use of uh, the existence of trichomes, of uh, hairy plant structures that we talked about er earlier, uh, or uh, leaf toughness or things like that. Uh, there are some uh, uh, caterpillars, for example, uh, that, uh, such as this one here, that actually have very um, scleritized prolegs that allow them to basically uh, have an armor so that they don't get damaged by these, uh, by these hooks. So having a hard external outer shell, unlike the soft-bodied aphids, is a way in which these insects can actually access uh, these plants that otherwise could be quite damaging uh, to them. Another way is that uh, certain caterpillars, we talked about uh, plant uh, toughness as a potential um, deterrent or uh, defense mechanism. Uh, well, how do you overcome plant toughness? You just plow right through it. There are certain um, uh, caterpillars here of uh, skipper butterflies that have these enormous heads, and inside of these enormous heads are very strong muscles that allow basically the mandibles to rip through all kinds of really tough uh, tissues such as grasses uh, or other things that are rich in silica, which we've already described as having a really uh, strong impact on, uh, on the ability for insects to even break in through that, that tissue. Another way is to just remove some of those uh, physical barriers that might exist, such as the trichomes. Here, for example, is what it looks like when uh, a particular, um, these are monarch caterpillars that have actually gone through and mowed down all of the trichomes on a milkweed plant. So that all you see here are the little stubs of the trichomes remaining, and here they're still uh, intact. Once that layer has actually been removed, literally shaved off or mowed off, then they can access the leaf tissue without the, the spines getting into their, uh, into their mandibles. Here's a simple little experiment. Uh, that, that was done here um, with these uh, leaf beetles where they looked at different instars of beetles, different stages, either early on or all the way up to adults, and they literally shaved the hairs off of their uh, particular host plants that they normally uh, would feed on. And then they looked at which, uh, what kind of plants that they actually uh, preferred, the ones that were shaved or the ones that were not shaved. And you can see here that uh, especially for the younger instars, which generally would struggle to get into those uh, plant tissues, they uh, have an increase in preference for those uh, plants from which those trichomes have actually uh, been taken off compared to the later instars or the adults. Here's another pre-ingestive way in which some herbivores can uh, reduce the potential damage that plants have on them. We learned earlier that uh, there's a certain class of compounds, the linear uh, phranocoumarins, 
that uh, in the presence of UV light are photoactive and cross-link DNA causing cell replication and other things to become uh, damaged. Well, if you can prevent UV light from actually uh, hitting the, the leaves as you're feeding on them, this could minimize that kind of damage. And in fact, there are some uh, caterpillars uh, like this one here that produce leaf rolls like this. They will actually create, use a little bit of silk to roll up the leaf, and then they feed from the inside of the leaves of these plants like St. John's wort that contain these uh, linear uh, foranocoumarins, therefore preventing that uh, photo uh, activation to actually happen. Another way in which uh, plants can um, prevent insects from actually getting at them is, uh, in the first place, is to basically immobilize or otherwise gum up the mouth parts of insects through the secretion of either latexes or uh, resins that are maintained in canals in the vascular tissue of the plant. And as soon as the insects bite on the leaf, these uh, compounds are basically shot out. Uh, I'm sure many of you have experienced this. If you take a milkweed plant and you just kind of snap it, you immediately see these little beads of this white uh, substance uh, kind of pooling up like this. Now the substance is not only sticky, but it's also full of cardinalides, which are toxic especially for non-specialized insects, but even for specialized ones. Uh, here you can see what happens when, uh, when one of these veins was cut, and here is even a tiny little monarch caterpillar, which um, presumably are able to deal with these uh, chemicals, but uh, if a lot of them come out and they coat the insect or they get into the, into to the mouth parts, the smaller ones might be, uh, might be still susceptible uh, to those. So there are some insects that have actually developed ways of circumventing these uh, latex uh, defenses, uh, basically by deactivating these uh, pressurized uh, canals, either by cutting the veins, by trenching leaves, or by overall kind of mass attacking uh, a plant. This is particularly true with, uh, with trees and bark beetles, so that they just can't produce uh, enough pressure for the um, for the resins to actually uh, come out. So let's take a look at some of these, uh, these examples. Uh, here, by the way, is an example of uh, different kinds of vein structures that certain uh, plants have. This is kind of a classic uh, ramifying, branching uh, uh, architecture of uh, the uh, vascular system where there's kind of a main uh, vein and then there's these lateral veins and from these there's kind of sub uh, branches that come off of that. Uh, in comparison, there are uh, other plants that actually have kind of a reticulate uh, system of, of veins that look more like this. This is called anastomizing versus ramifying. And insects have different ways of dealing with these different kinds of uh, leaf vein architectures uh, when they have uh, these, uh, these compounds in them. This is a great review paper by uh, David Dessour uh, where uh, here's an example of uh, monarch caterpillars. Actually, this is a different uh, um, uh, Danaeus uh, species that clip the, ed, uh, the, the leaves at uh, the midrib uh, here, and then they feed on the distal part of the, of the plant where the pressure, where the tissues can, can't get that pressurized um, leaf resin uh, to get there. Uh, there are uh, caterpillar, oh, I'm sorry, there's uh, grasshoppers here that are doing the same things by clipping uh, the veins and then feeding on the distal parts, they can avoid that, uh, that as well. Here's a milkweed beetle doing the same uh, and, uh, and so on. Very common. Uh, another way for the anastoti anastomizing uh, leaf vein structure is since you can't just clip one vein because the, uh, the, the, um, the resins and uh, the uh, latexes are maintained throughout the leaves, what, you, what these caterpillars uh, and these herbivores have to do is actually create a trench that goes across the entire uh, system. And once they've done that, as you can see here, then they can feed on the distal portions without the, um, uh, the pressure of those resins and latexes actually uh, getting there. Here's another example of a, of a leaf trench and then feeding on the distal portions uh, as well. And there's all kinds of clever ways in which insects do this. Uh, here you can, again, see another uh, example of a monarch caterpillar that's been able to clip these veins and then feeding uh, where they can't actually occur. Here's a circular trench uh, here. And what you will find is that the de deactivation of these canals actually does in fact reduce the exposure uh, of the caterpillars to these, um, uh, to these uh, compounds, to these latexes. And uh, 
when you clip the veins uh, compared to when you, I'm sorry, when you keep the veins intact versus when you clip them, and then you put different kinds of herbivore species on them, you know, you can see that when the leaves have been, when the veins have been severed, there's a significant decrease in the exudate uh, that can reach them and therefore, inf and therefore uh, affect them. Uh, and there's some insects that are just better at uh, dealing at stealthily eating the plants uh, so that uh, they even, um, even they will induce a smaller production of, uh, lower production of, um, of those latexes.